Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top-selling authors and the up-and-coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Hi, everyone. Sam Hankin here. Welcome to another edition of The Avid Reader, brought to you by Wellington Square Bookshop. Our guest today is Dylan Jones. He's the author of Loaded. The Uncensored Oral History of the Velvet Underground. It was published by Grand Central and released earlier this year. Dylan's many books, and he's very, very prolific, cover a lot of ground from David Bowie to Jim Morris and U2, a dictionary of popular music, a book about the 80s, one about Jimmy Webb of all people, and the Wichita Lineman, which is a 45 that I may have purloined from and got caught from some store a long time ago. Um, the New Romantics, Elvis. He was the editor of GQ and is the editor-in-chief of the Evening Standard. And earlier this month, he wrote a short note in it about free speech and some of the absurdities of modern culture. I would suggest you look at that. And culture is what Loaded is really about. So yeah, it's about Lou Reed. Yeah, it's about the Velvets, but it's also about the whole time, which I remember so clearly about Andy Warhol, The Factory, Chelsea Girls. And so much more from a few years in the only city in the world, and in which I wish I had run away to instead of college and law school. And the mm -hmm. rest of it, I probably would have joined the 27 Club or even earlier, but it would have been quite the experience. And, and it's quite odd and coincidental, but my daughter came home for Thanksgiving last week and was carrying an LP. And she asked me if I had anything that could play vinyl. And I said, like a record player. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I played it for her. It was some indie band that wasn't very good. So I bragged about my massive collection, which is stored in one garage or another for the past 55 years. And we went out and this was the first one I found. It's uh, uh, it's the Lou Reed uh, Velvet Underground, latter Velvet Underground at Max's Kansas City, which is a big part of the book. And it was recorded on cassette by Bridget Berlin or Bridget Polk, who's also featured in the book in a, a factory Chelsea girl. So my two brushes with greatness, and then I'll get on with it, is I went to the main point in Bryn Mawr in 1969. The Velvets were playing. It was back when you got a table in the front of by the stage and they'd bring you coffee or Coke and a sandwich. And I was sitting there like two feet away from Lou Reed. And they were playing, it might have been heroin or something. And the power went out and he was pissed. And then it came back on and he continued to play. And then the power went out again. And when it came back on, he goes, screw you, except he didn't say screw. And he just dumped his guitar and they all walked off stage. And in retrospect, and this is like the book, I felt that that was a better performance than the actual concert would have been. And then the second one was at the concert for Tibet right before he died. And he was there with Patti Smith and Ray Davies and Laurie Anderson, his wife. And he was there with just two guitarists. And he was like mad. He was like pumping them up and going more, more, more. And it was like, he was angry again. And I was so glad that he was still angry after uh, uh, four decades. And, and, uh, you know, the book really is, it's, it's an oral history. It's stories, musings, and ponderings from 170 people who had relationships with not only these guys, but Andy Warhol, well, obviously John Cale, Sterling Morrison, Mo Tucker, um, Doug and Stu Yule, but a panoply of others, including, of course, Nico, who I remember most because of all tomorrow's parties, which still resonates strongly with me. It was like a prediction of the future and then andy warhol the factory chelsea girls and hosts of others as well as we get to know more about david bowie jimmy page which was pretty cool and even henry rollins so welcome dylan uh thanks so much for joining us and for bringing back to me and to whoever reads this which will be many uh, so many memories and putting such a lovely gloss on them well thank you very much it sounds like i should have interviewed you <laughs> someone gave a comment on uh one of my YouTube said, and I said, you know, maybe the interview should just interviewer should just interview himself. <laughs> and my response was, yeah, that's a great idea. <laughs> so shall we start by just 
for those who don't remember or weren't there, shall we start by just setting the scene into which the Velvet Underground was inserted full blown? Well, initially you had a you had a, um, uh, a, a graduate college graduate malcontent Lou Reed, and who had already had um, b bizarre kind of shock therapy. You had a classical classically trained viola player um, from Wales, from the valleys in Wales, not not far from where I live now. Um, and you had a, uh, a German chanteur who had desperately tried to make it as a singer in Europe and had come to uh, New York. Um, you had this bizarre collection, plus you had Mo Tucker, who drummed standing up, wasn't a proper drummer. Um, you had this collection of oddballs who, in a very short period of time, uh, became embroiled in Warhol's factory. Um, and they were there for mutual benefit. Warhol thought he needed a group to add to his sort of portfolio of freaks and projects. They wanted management. And between them, they created a mini kind of storm. But I think, as we all know, that the first Velvet Underground record wasn't bought by many people, mere thousands. But every one of those people who listened to the Velvet Underground album went and formed their own band. Um, so they were influential in a way that I don't think anyone else has really been influential since because they set a template um, and their vision uh, and their kind of landscape of internal conflict, um, sexual degradation and drug use became um, the the most important IP of all alternative rock. So um, uh, I think it's interesting these days that what ha because we consume music in very different ways uh, and, and people, people like my daughter, my 24 year old daughter, they go grazing in Spotify and they come across things and they come across things without any context. So it's possible to listen to lots of music that sounds a bit like the Velvet Underground. It's possible to look at lots of photographs of pop groups who look like the Velvet Underground. But when you discover that the Velvet Underground were there first and there was nothing before them, that's when it becomes really interesting. Before we get into the structure of the book, I had a question that I thought about because you really touch upon it. Like today with the Kardashians and with real housewives there's this culture of reality that isn't really reality reality tv isn't reality tv and you know like if i hand you a hundred dollar bill the only reason you'll give me anything in return is because there's this mass delusion if you will that this hundred this piece of paper is worth something are you going to give me a hundred dollar bill <laughs> i'd be glad to if you can answer <laughs> that question for me because <laughs> I think about it all the time. It's like Andy Warhol created this reality that wasn't reality at all. He created a culture that really didn't exist. Like I said in the introduction, you know, he didn't go to a party. He was the party. His people were the party. And it's not just the 15 minutes of fame thing. It's just the idea of creating something that really wasn't there. Can you understand the question, what, what I'm saying? Well, I, I I understand your statement. Yeah, what's what's the question? The question is, even when he was like, he used to he like talked to the Fords, and they were talking to him like he was a real person, and it was really about him. And then when he had on the talk show, I forget which factory girl it was who answered the questions for him because he didn't want to speak, but it wasn't really true. He could speak, so there was all these, if you will, affectations that people were designed, it was designed for people to believe, but it wasn't really real in the sense of whatever is real, the tree I'm looking at. Yes, it was. It was totally real. And uh, his genius was, yeah. was finding a way to, to give himself a platform in a decade that he totally got. 
he understood the vacuum. He understood that there was a possibility where someone like him could invent um, some systems in order to get noticed. Um, and he did this in a variety of ways. And I, I suppose, apart from the art itself, the most obvious manifestation was creating a group of people around him that were a support system that added to his luster, that made him seem more important, that allowed him to become more enigmatic, but principally um, afforded him success, um, which all, is all amazing and all very, very clever from a PR point of view. But the kernel of truth, the reality that you're talking about, was the fact that as an artist, he was a true genius in the same way that Picasso was a genius or maybe David Bowie was a genius. He had an ability to shape shift. He had an ability to um, uh, bend himself towards uh, on oncoming culture, to define culture and do it in a way which was very appealing to people, that was very attractive. Um, but he had innate talent. That's what made him really, really interesting. I think there is so, so much about Warhol, which is fascinating, which makes him sort of inexhaustible as a subject. And I think if you're a writer and you're writing about culture and you're writing about how culture started in the post-war period and you look at the that 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 sort of 70 year period of, of, of um, post-war art and culture, you look at the narrative arc of that. And Warhol plays such an important role in that because of when he happened and what he invented. And even from a, a, a purely visual idea, that if you look at the, the template, the visual template of the Velvet Underground, you can also look at Warhol as a visual template of how people would look if they're trying to o operate on the margins of society. Yeah, it, it, but in your introduction, the, the I, I guess kind of like the epigraph is, is where he's saying during the 60s, people forgot what emotions were and he doesn't think they've ever remembered. So what was he trying to, what was, and I'll leave this alone after I ask this. So if if they forgot their emotions and they've never remembered them, was his task either to imbue them back in or was his task just to work within that constraint? No, I think it was to distract them. And I think in the course of distracting them, using himself as the main distraction because he was marketing himself, no one else, um, that people became distracted because the culture on offer was suddenly kaleidoscopic because everything started with the 60s. It was like a switch, both in switch. both in North America and in the UK, almost simultaneously. Well, if if we're trying to sell your book, which we are, we should now move to the structure of the book, and that was kind of a good segue because one, well, first of all, bibliography is great, and then the dramatis personae was also personae was really good too. But how did you get and and I know some of the sources you had already existed, but how did you get 170 different, it must have been an incredible amount of work, 170 people? Well, I've done four of these books now. I did an oral biography of Bowie. Then I did an oral biography of the New Romantic Movement. Then I did an oral biography of um, the Britpop Peep Year 1995. And now I did Warhol and the, and the Velvets. And most of these subjects have been done before, but I think as a writer, as a biographer, you have to have a certain amount of arrogance to, to basically stick your hand up and say, I'm going to do this better than anyone else. And you have to, that has to be your starting point. Nobody starts something saying, well, I'd quite like to do something a bit like that, or I'd like to do that too. You say, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do it better than anyone else. And I think you have to start off with that, um, that premise. And in terms of the number of people, 
uh, I suppose when I started with Bowie, I knew that the more people you spoke to, even though I knew Bowie very well and I had my own understanding of his personality, his motivation, his talent, um, his narrative, his story, his failings, et cetera, et cetera. I wanted as many different voices in there as as possible because I think the more people you speak to, you get a you get a greater sense of the truth. Plus, you're talking often about the things that happened 50 years ago, and people's recollections differ. Uh, and I love that. I love, love the contradiction of two people being at the same party and having a completely different impression of, of what happened. And who's to say they're both not right? But with Bowie and with all the books I've done, I knew that there are, there's always a third of the people that you have to have in a book, okay? If you're writing a book about Lou Reed and the Velvets, there are certain people you have to speak to if they're still alive or else it's not a proper book. And if you can't speak to those people, you use verified sources that you that, that you get approval to use. Then there are another third people who are the people who don't often get the limelight, whose stories are just as important as the as the more bold-faced names that people do speak um, to in, in, in books like this. And then there's a third lot where people say, well, have you spoken to Samantha? And you go, no, who the hell is Samantha? And so you find Samantha, you go and interview Samantha, and you put Samantha's testimony in the book. So there's a lot of Samanthas in this book too. So I think those are the, the three main pillars. And there are 170 voices in the book because I think you need to do things properly. There's there's too much mediocre material out there. There are too many mediocre books. There are too many me mediocre videos, films, podcasts, everything. Uh, and if you're going to do something, you do it properly. And I take great pride in that. So I think the more voices, the better. Yeah, it's funny now you were talking about Spotify. It's like YouTube also. You can listen to 20 interviews with Lou Reed. Um, unfortunately, a lot of them are from his very latter years. But the one thing that runs through the book is, you know, whether people hated him or admired him or had affairs with him or thought he was an asshole. Um, one of the themes that ran through it for me was the fact that he had no appreciation or didn't feel as if other music was worthy, whether it was the Beatles, whether it was the Grateful Dead, whether it was the Jefferson Airplane. In fact, and what really brought it home to me was the fact that the one John Lennon song that he loved was Mother. And I can understand that perfectly. And I don't necessarily feel like I can understand the fact that he just hated the Beatles songs, except your writing and the word, yeah, your writing um, made me kind of understand why he thought of them as posers. Well, I think that, I mean, my caveat to all of this would be, I never trust anyone who says they don't like the Beatles, not really. Um, but I think he, I think his petulance and his arrogance and his egocentric sort of mania and his belief in his own talent was something that he carried with him throughout his career and his life, although he softened a bit towards the end. Um, but I think he also enjoyed being a professional arsehole. Um, Danny Fields, who is someone I've known for a very, very long time, and has I've uh, has contributed to many of my books, uh, and as a lovely, sweet, clever man who's had an extraordinary life, he um, we had a mutual friend called Anita Sarko, uh, who was a sort of performance artist and DJ in New York about forty years ago, and she was interviewing Lou Reed for uh, some magazine. I can't remember which magazine. It'll be a downtown magazine maybe details, something like that, before it became um, Condé Nastified, or East Village Eye, something like that. And um, she, knew, she knew that Danny knew Lou Reed. And so she said to Danny, look, I'm interviewing Lou Reed next week. Uh, and I know he's such an asshole. Can you just tell him not to be an asshole with me? Please, can you, can you do that? 
So Danny and, and, and Lou Reed used the same gym um, uh, somewhere downtown. Uh, and they were they were on the they were on the on the cross training bikes, and um, Danny says to Lou, he says, "Look, a friend of mine, Anita, is coming to interview you next week. Can you just do me a favor? You know, she's family. She's please don't don't be an asshole. Please don't be an asshole." And Lou says, "Fine, you've told me. And I'll, I'll, yeah, of course." And so a couple of weeks later, Anita runs into Danny and says, "What what happened?" What did you say to Lou Reed? He was an absolute pig. And so the next time Danny's in the in the in the gym with Lou Reed, he says, I told you. Well, what did you do with Anita? Anita was family. I said, be nice, be careful. He said, I was. I said, for the first couple of minutes, I was delightful. And then she said something, and I, I just turned into Lou Reed. <laughs> and I think that's what he did. And I think he found it funny. I think he 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 knew that it disarmed people. It was his public persona as much as anything else. I think it also made it easy for him to get rid of people who, did, who he didn't want to interact with. And that became an amplified version of, of who he was. And that, that sort of mediated version of Lou Reed became what he was throughout his entire career, which is why a lot of journalists went to interview Lou Reed wanting the confrontational Lou Reed wanting him to to berate them or um call them out for not having enough knowledge of his work not being smart enough all of that shit and a lot of it's very funny and i interviewed a lot of journalists and a lot of friends of mine who'd interviewed lou reed um who um who had that experience and as much as they professed to hate it they they sort of loved it because it gave them a, a war story but um I think also a little like, I mean, I've interviewed Van Morrison quite a few times. And again, Van Morrison is meant to be like Lou Reed. You know, he's a difficult person. He's a cantankerous person to interview. Difficult. Doesn't suffer fools gladly, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But let's analyze that. He doesn't suffer fools gladly. And I'm not a stupid person. I do my homework. And whenever I've, interviewed Van Morrison, he's been perfectly civil because I asked the right questions. If you're an arsehole, you haven't done your homework, I'll treat you like shit because he's not interested. Life's too short. He's got no respect for you. Is he a bit rude? Possibly. And I think Lou Reed was a bit like that. But, you know, it, for him, I think with Van Morrison, it's and something more innate. I don't think it's manufactured, but I think Lou Reed certainly had the ability to manufacture his personality at will. Yeah. Yeah, well, like the whole, well, yeah, that's what I was saying about Warhol, too. You know, it's funny, I was thinking, I'm like eight years older than you. So when I, when I saw Lou Reed, I was 16, but you were just a little kid. So how did you start getting interested in all this? Because you were like, kind of like at the tail end of the time period you were talking David about. David Bowie. In our, I was a very impression, impressionable 12-year-old uh, um, uh, who, 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 who fell in love with David Bowie when he was 12 years old. And to us, I mean, now you just open up your telephone, ev everything's there. You know, literally everything is there. And you don't have to go very far to discover stuff. Back then, you, could, you, did, you didn't know anything. You couldn't get hold of anything. Um, you didn't know anything about books, records, movies, culture, politics, anything. Um, there was mainstream media and there was the stuff around the edges that you needed to work quite hard to discover. And, and David Bowie was like our Google. And if David Bowie said, Iggy Pop's cool. Okay, <laughs> Iggy Pop's cool. Or Lou Reed or Mott the Hoople or anyone, we go, fine. You know, David Bowie says they're cool. I'm going to go and find some Lou Reed records. And that, that's what I did. Plus, at that, hit that period of Bowie, 72, 73, also coincided with um, his involvement with Lou Reed and and helping enormously along with uh, Mick Ronson with the, the arrangement and the production of Transformer, which is obviously Lou Reed's most successful solo record, something that really pissed Lou Reed off. Um, but yeah, so the, the very long answer to your very short pertinent question, it was through David Bowie. So funny because 
because of David Bowie, I discovered Mott the Hoople. And then I read the book Mott the Hoople. And none of that would have happened without him and all the young dudes. I would not have known. Of course. Any of, them. of course. Yeah. I, and the other thing you see, and that's the other thing about you is you can say kind of like what people might think, oh, well, you're kind of like the same. Because you would say things like in that one interview about Bowie, you said, oh, well, all he wants to do is impress you, blah, blah, blah. And then Henry Rollins said, as you said, the cool thing about Bowie is he would listen to you and he wanted to find out about you. And that's such a nice thing for someone to do. But it also, people don't do it today because there's no civil discourse, which is like what your um, what your note in the standard was like when you talked about solutionizing. But the thing yeah. is, I can't, I don't know how you can bite both your lips. I tried biting both of my lips, but I can't. <laughs> Figure of speech. <laughs> well, so is solutionizing. Um, <laughs> but uh, what was I? <laughs> See, this is what I do. Um, You're a rambler. I like that. It's good. <laughs> well, that's well. That's the thing about you. Look, because I'm researching you, I now know what you do at the evening standard. You know. Sure. No, I think that the um, I, I think the other thing that I want to do with the book which no one else has ever done, is to actually take all that story all the way through. Because if there, there are quite now, there, there are quite a few Velvet Underground books. Some of them are good, some of them are awful, but they principally tell the story. It's it's the story. You know, it's the story, is the story, is the story. Um, but they all end with, they either follow Lou Reed's career or they end with the dissolution of the Velvets in the early 70s. And I wanted to take all of those people's careers forward. So I'd chart Lou Reed, Warhol, Nico, Mo Tucker, Study Morrison, John Cale. Um, and consequently, a, a different picture emerges because you get various different sort of hues of their careers, the highs and the lows. Um, and that I always found interesting because for me, particularly these days where everything is mediated, everything is, is, is there if you want it. You know, if you suddenly decided that you, maybe you, maybe you're a huge expert on Donovan, but if you're not, and you wanted to become an expert on Donovan, you'd become an expert on Donovan in about 90 minutes, I reckon, you know, with a phone, uh, you probably, you can listen to anything, you can read everything, you can watch everything, you can form your own opinion. You, you can certainly, you're like your own AI, okay? Um, but I, uh, I, I've always been interested in what people are doing when they're not being famous. It's like, I, I was writing about this the other day. Um, people, muggles, critics, us, we talk. We 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 assume that famous people. Are, um, we look at famous people through their work, and you take any person, and their work is an element of what they do. You've got work, then you've got sex, you've got going out to eat, you've got paying bills, you've got going on holiday, you've got exercise, all the other things you do in your life, and those are the interesting things. The work is the work is the work. And a lot of that is informed by the other stuff that you do. But it's like a, and sometimes it's a byproduct and sometimes it's just work. You know, some artists or pop stars, whatever you call them, they'll do something every four years. It might take them nine months. They might do a bit of touring. But what, what do they do the rest of the time? That's what I'm interested in. Where they live. How they, we used to, I used to work at the Sunday Times, the Sunday Times newspaper about 30 years ago. And in our magazine, the Sunday Times magazine, which was, you know, in its time, it was a very important publication, slightly before I got there, but it was still a big publication when I worked there. And the back page was called Life in a Day. And it was about the minutiae of what famous people did in a day. Like what time you got up, how many times you went for a pee in the middle of the night, what tea you drank in the morning, what you ate, did you take the dog for a walk, etc., etc. That was, and they were all fascinating, even if you weren't interested in the people. 
I remember there was one one person, I won't tell you who it is, a sort of second division pop star um, who completely got the wrong end of the stick. And they concertinaed an entire year into a day. So it was sort of like got up, wrote a concept album, had a meeting with Martin Scorsese, went to the moon, you know, had a bespoke suit fitted. It was just nonsense. And it was kind of, he embarrassed himself by 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 showing off in, in that way. But when these pieces worked, it was about the the minutiae, the sort of humdrum things that, that a person did, which always far more interesting. Well, it's like uh, going back to empiricism or experiential Descartes, you know, the idea of what we see is the only thing there is and how do we know that what we perceive is what actually exists. And so take, take for example, Taylor Swift, which is Taylor Swift, we know everything about her, but we don't know whether it's true. She's omniscient now. She's omnipotent. She rules the world. She's a billionaire. She's on her tour now. She has her new romance, which she, which may be a romance, maybe not. But we now, it's a different world because now we have access to her, whether it's Instagram or whatever it is, or, or the media, every moment of her life, who her friends are, what she dressed up as what she does every day and it's a completely different you're completely right i mean i find although and i was thinking about whether or not there's a piece in this yeah there is i know i know so much about her and all of that stuff that you mentioned you could hold a gun to my head and i could not sing more than one taylor swift song which i find quite interesting because i know just by dint of you know being alive, you I, I know a lot of material produced by a lot of people I don't like just because it's so rad. But I know that song. Um, it goes something like we will never ever ever get back together, right? I don't even know what it's called. I don't, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But I literally you could hold guns to the, 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 the foreheads of my children and force me to think of another Taylor Swift song. And I can't, and I don't say that to be cute or, or or kind of arch. I just don't. But and and yet I know a lot about her. Weird. I'm cor I'm corroborating what you're saying. Yeah, except for the fact that you're missing the point that when you were listening to this, your parents had no idea of what a David Bowie song was. And but my yeah, and, that, and and they and they didn't want to. Yeah, but this isn't a generational thing. Back then, it was a. a a generational thing and it was also something that people thought would be a phase and of course it isn't because that world now informs what we do as as humans yeah but it's just it's just pushed out it's pushed at us it wasn't pushed at us before it's constantly pushed it, it no, i think it's pushed it's pushed me pull you you know the, we want it we like it well, I don't want to know about the Kardashians, but I know a lot about them, and I don't even want to begin to know about them. But I do. Yeah. Why? Do I, yeah. I don't want to use the space. I don't want to use the space in my brain to store information about them. Too late. Right. right. <laughs> but my brother, who lives in a cultural cave, if I asked him who Kim Kardashian was, he wouldn't know. Well, he's a lucky it's man. Right. But the thing about us is that, as you said, we're smart and we're inquisitive. And so we absorb things that are put before us rather than hiding away from them. You know, yeah. it's weird. Yeah. But that's what you write. I mean, that's as editor in chief of the Evening Standard and, and reading your note and agreeing with it completely. And, you know, I don't want to hear people telling me to reach out and circle back and um, sign their letters best or use their pronouns i don't want any of that but i have it you know yeah i don't want to circle like... that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. circle back now just fuck off <laughs> i'll circle back with you after we finish and i'll reach, I'll reach out to your publicist there's another one but i can't think of what it is <laughs> but i think honestly the um you know, I, I don't go into these projects lightly. And I think you have to, you start off with the premise saying, well, I think I can do this better than other people. And I think I've got something original to say about this. And, and hopefully I have. And I think that the, 
you know, with some of my books, with the New Romantics book, that hadn't been done before. With the Jimmy no. Webb book, that, that hadn't been done before. But you know, there are books about Lou Reed, there are books about Warhol, but you have to start off with the premise that A, intellectually, I have something that I think is different to say about this collection of people. And structurally, this book has not been done in this form. And that was that was interesting to me. Plus also, the other thing, it, it, a different thing from this book to any of my other books is that a lot of the people I was interviewing were of a certain age. And there was a, a distinct possibility that some of these people might not have been still alive when the book came out. Um, yeah. And that's, you know, there are lots of people like David, uh, David Bailey, Nikki Haslam, some of the Warhol sets, um, photographers, lots of different people. And you think, actually, if i gone back in three or four years' time, maybe they wouldn't be there. And the other thing about that is that those people aren't weren't there for many of the readers who are in their 20s, 40s, whatever. Like, for example, like Jonathan Richmond. No one knows who Jonathan Richmond is. I do. You know? Um. Yeah, but then I suppose. I mean, hopefully, someone will be watching this or listening to this, and well, that's what I've been saying. Yeah, they will. You know, they will go down the rabbit hole of um, a Jonathan Richmond rabbit hole. In fact, going back to my previous points, do you know who Duncan Hanna is? No. Well, you're a very bad man. And what I suggest is that when this is over, you go down a Duncan Hanna um, 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 wormhole or rabbit hole. He was an artist who I interviewed who was very much around the Max's CBGB's um, period in the early 70s uh, and knew all of this bunch of people very well. Great artist. And he wrote a brilliant memoir about the 70s called 20th Century Boy. And he came out maybe five years ago. And he actually wrote a follow-up, a, a sequel, if you will, um, which has yet to be published. But I published um, a chapter of it in, in British GQ when I was the editor there, before I left. But Duncan came to my house in London uh, near Marble Arch. And we sat around my kitchen table. And I interviewed him for, the, for, for Loaded, for the book about the Velvets. And he was brilliant and incisive and funny. And, um, you know, we have a kind of mutual um, admiration society. And he went back to New York and two weeks later he died. Um, so that's an illustration of, and he wasn't even that old. He was older than me, but he wasn't that old. But that's an illustration of it was important for me to, to, to get to those people before they died. Because I think if someone attempts this in 10 years' time, those people won't still be there. Well, if I'm a bad man for not knowing him, would people be a bad people because they don't know who Nick Drake is, who also was seminal? Oh, well, I mean, they wouldn't just be bad people. They, they, they probably ought to be shot. I mean, you know. You've been shooting a lot of people in this interview or putting <laughs> guns to people's heads. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even being metaphorical either. <laughs> Don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, so when I let's see when you so like say for example, let's see, say Jimmy Page. That was so much fun reading about Jimmy Page. He's such a he's such a nice person. Did you ever see that documentary? It might get loud with um. Of course. Yeah. So when he's listening to, uh, you know, what song is it that he's listening to? And he's so happy at the very beginning. R Rumble? No. Uh, Nick Ray? What is it? Um, Rumble. Yeah. Yeah. When he's listening to that and he's so happy and he's like going like that and he's listening to the reverb. It's just like you can look at him for like 30 seconds and know this is a really nice person. Oh, he's great. I mean, he's... um. Jimmy's a fabulous person and very generous with his time and anecdotes. And um, he was interesting because 
not only did he meet Lou, not only did he meet and see the Velvet Underground and Warhol, but also he wrote and produced Nico when she was living in London in the mid sixties, um, which I knew, but I and I also knew that he'd never talked about it before, um, which was interesting. It's quite funny when he talked about going to see the Velvet Underground. He's went to see them in New York in '68, uh, maybe. So not kind of prime exploding plastic inevitable period but just a little bit after that and i said what was the what was your defining takeaway from seeing the velvet underground he said they were loud they were really really loud and this is the man who invented led zeppelin <laughs> but he so liked everybody one, else yeah that was one of their that was one of their tricks though that one of their things was to bowlerize people with with the light show and also to just turn everything up so it was really really loud which freaked people out because they'd never heard anything so loud in their lives. And because the music was discordant and deliberately ugly, um, it made for a very intense experience. Well, that's the other thing. And the other theme that runs through the book is that this was not pleasant. This was not a pleasant thing for people. And so many people, not only did it change their lives completely, but it was either like, being in hell or music to commit suicide by and yeah yet... i mean I, I a lot of it was and a lot of it was a, a deliberately so but on the flip side of that you had a bunch of people principally lou reed who could write these beautiful affecting lullabies um which sounded as though they 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 were made by people like Nick Drake. They were sort of lilting and affectionate and small and acoustic yeah. and you know. like who who loves the sun. Yeah, but the th oh, you know what my favorite you know what my favorite song is. No, I mean I don't. Well, okay. Well, listening to me for blab on for twenty minutes. Well, no, you wouldn't know. My favorite song is Ocean, but not Ocean on the album, the, the outtake on Loaded, the outtake of Ocean. Yeah, it's great. The, um, I think there's a version of that on the double live album. Yep. Yep. Yeah, that's good. The double live album is, is pretty much the quintessential Velvet Underground per, um, purchase. I think if you were only allowed to right. buy one album, it should be the double live. You talk about the uh, the lilting songs, and then, you know, after Mo was pregnant, and after the Yules came along, and then you know they became popular because of "Who Loves the Sun," "Sweet Jane," um, the songs that. How did he feel about that? I, you know, you touch upon that in the book. Was he pissed off that that was the music that ended up making him as much as he became a rock star? Yeah, I think I I think so. There was, you know, he was, but it was pretty easy to piss Lou Reed off. But you talk about the covers of Sweet Jane and how everybody everybody covered Sweet Jane, and it's true they did. It's kind of bizarre when you think about it because I recall, you know, if I I go reel back fifty years to when I was a teenager, and all those awful garage bands, everybody was forming a band and. Yeah, you'd play um, Satisfaction by the Stones or um, Smoke on the Water by Deep Purple and then Sweet Jane, you know, and it's like, really? And you think about it now, it's really bizarre, but that was the song that everyone attempted to play, Sweet Jane. Because I suppose it sounded like an, uh, an archetypal rock song, which in some respects it was. Dodd. Yeah, and, and rock and roll. Her life was changed by rock and, rock and roll. You know, a different song that everyone identified with because their lives were changed by rock and roll. Sure. Well, going back to Warhol, one thing that always struck me was that it's just because of the way I'm built is like I do screw around with reality in my head. I have a tenuous hold on it. And so like when Andy Warhol was shot, Three days later, Robert F. Kennedy was shot. And I thought in Andy Warhol's mind, the perfect thing would have been if they were shot at exactly the same moment. Or if Kennedy wasn't shot at all, because it was a, it was very anticlimactic. I know. I, he, missed the, he missed the front pages. Like when Aldous Huxley died at the same time as John F. Kennedy. 
And who else died? It's like the um, it's like when um, Harvey Oswald gets shot. He's brought down to um, either to be arraigned or 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 to or, or to, to a travel to travel to a. Uh, um, I can't remember the circumstances. Where I, just... it went, it, he was being taken to a different facility, I think. Yeah. And there were all the press photographers, and. He, he, as he's traveling through this hall, hallway, one photographer takes a picture of him, and then a nanosecond later, a, sec a second photographer takes a picture of him, which is when he's shot. And that picture has become one of the most famous pictures in the history of American portraiture, if you like. And the other guy probably has been haunted by it for the rest of his life. That's how it works. That's how it works, okay. baby. Well, the other thing was speaking of getting shot. We talk, we're talking a lot about getting shot. Um, is when they asked Warhol what it was like being shot, and he gave the perfect answer because he couldn't. What did he say? You said it. I can't remember. He said like he. It wasn't like I. It wasn't. I couldn't tell you what it was like being shot because it was like somebody else being shot. It wasn't me being shot. He was, his life was about observation. Uh, I don't know. I might be screwed up with this. Um, I Where mean, I, I think people take the, the Valerie Solana shooting was, um, it had far more of a, an effect on Warhol than uh, and even people now think. I think it's, um, it totally changed his life. Totally, 100%. Yeah. It went, it, it his life changed 180 degrees when that happened. Yeah, it, and it, it became, and it was a bit like it's a bit like people going into rehab or um, having a serious illness. You come out the other side, and you feel refreshed and um, renewed because your life has begun again. You had a second chance, and you 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 tend to be more motivated. You tend to be less hedonistic. And you tend to be more driven by security, money, and uh, creative success, which is what he did. The other thing I liked because it made me feel better about myself was the diaries. Because in the diaries, and you talk about dictating in the morning, um, you know, it's like paid the taxi driver $4.12 and gave him a 25 cent tip or what he had to eat. And that's what all my journals are. There's nothing interesting in my journals or exciting it's just had lunch at and what i had for lunch uh, that, the that's I mean. the, uh, the amplification of minutiae and the uh, the importance paid to tiny seemingly inconsequential events i think again is part of warhol's genius yeah i agree definitely why is that because it hadn't been done before because it's clever because it says so much about the culture that we're in now. Yeah, I guess so. I think it's the I think the other thing is, I think, you know, I think my final word, word on Warhol would really be that if you cast your mind back to when he became famous, and even when he started, when I became aware of him, which was 10 years after he really... Um, started to get a reputation for himself. Everyone thought he was a phony. It's kind of amazing. People would say Andy Warhol, they go, yeah, that the guy's a phony. He's a phony. It's not real. It, 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 he doesn't believe it. It's, it's a con, it's a trick. And I think that's fascinating. And I think that's something that people have forgotten. Because we talk about him, about uh, being a, a media manipulator, um, someone who is smarter than everyone in his orbit, smarter than everyone who tried to mediate him. And yet he was thought of as a phony. Oh, that guy who does soapboxes. Yeah, he wasn't taken seriously. Yeah, well, because... That's amazing. Well, because people look at a Campbell's soup can and then his Campbell's soup can, and they're wondering, this is not art because it's just a thing. And it's sure. Not Absolutely. 
there was this one artist, I think he did like a cubic foot of gold and then he signed his name to it. So then it became more, worth more than gold. And I always ask my kids about that. Do you, do you think it's worth more than what it was? And that goes back to, again, my concept of reality. Oh, it's it, because it's authored. Yeah, it's like Duchamp. Uh, yeah, who Lou Reed liked and the idea of- you know, Yeah, of course, yeah. And, and also, then, Lou Lou was in that in that respect. He was a genuine punk because it was a it was a fuck you. I'm going to do this. Well, what about and, that, and 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 that was that was largely genuine. Well, what about you know the name Velvet Underground and then uh, um, and then the songs that are essentially you know based on masochism and then but then you go to Delmore Schwartz and in Dreams Begin Responsibilities. And, you know, the fact that he graduated with honors from Syracuse, where my brother went. I mean, what did all that intellectual background do for his music? And especially Delmore Schwartz, because that's a great... Well, I think, it, I think it informed it. I think it became a... It, not only could, did it inform his lyrics, but it also informed... It also in, empowered him to be, you know, in his ability to espouse his own work and the way he discussed other people's work before he deliberately became a monosyllabic druggie. Um, you know, he was, um, he was incredibly articulate and became even more articulate later when, when he could be minded to. When he talked about heroin and like Burroughs can write about heroin, he goes, wouldn't it be great if you could write a novel within a song rather than them saying, we're going to ban this song because it talks about heroin when they don't, ban the book because it talks about sure. it. Sure. Yeah, so, okay. So, okay. So he's an intellectual. He has a great deal of knowledge about culture and the past. Then the music right. becomes this just cacophony to a lot of people. So how does he translate what he's thinking about, what his beliefs are into this music that's so appalling to so many people. What's the connection between the literate Lou Reed and the musical Lou Reed? Because it was, it was, um, a, a lot of it was um, uh, play acting. It was, it was an art statement, which is why I think he enjoyed Warhol's company initially because it was, it was deliberately transgressive and. Uh, kind of funny in a way. Things shouldn't look like this. Art shouldn't look like this. Music shouldn't sound like this. It's funny. People shouldn't behave like this. People shouldn't take drugs like this. Shouldn't, 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 shouldn't. You know, it was all about the the sixties, which was should, 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 should. You know, let's try it. Let's do it. Well, beating and a there dead, we had it. Beating a dead horse, which is what I do, is like you. Okay, translate that to Edie Sedgwick. Here's a woman who had a real life that was tragic, but the real life there wasn't the same as the factory or Lou Reed or Warhol because she actually had a real life that was tragic. Yeah, well, she she was a dilettante. She was a rich kid. They're all rich, and, and she and she and no, no, they weren't all rich, but oh, she, no, no. She, no. She fell into this world and she was a bright spark for 18 months and then she kind of disappeared. And um, I think, you know, these scenes attract people like that because um, people go through periods where they want to um, slum. I think, don't you think that she was the most beautiful of all of them? Edie? Yeah. Yeah, that's why I named my my first daughter Edie. Yeah, really? Yeah, yeah. She says thank you. You name me after a heroin addict. Thanks. It's pretty funny. <laughs> You're really caught up in this. This is your whole. It's the I, you, I, I told you. I take it seriously. You do. Well, how'd you get so successful on other stuff like GQ and the Evening Standard? If your whole life is filled with all this rock and roll crap inside your head. But it's not rock and roll crap, it's culture. It's our culture. It's what we live in. But you've written about a lot of stuff. That, well, no, it, you're right. It is all culture. Yeah, it is. 
But what about going, okay, what, okay. I'm trying to pin things down and make, cause it hurt, this all hurts my head. So if you're going from Edie to Nico. Yeah. So Nico, you know, the whole relationship between Lou Reed and not wanting her as lead singer. But then I, but then again, okay. So most of her stuff I don't like because I don't think it makes any sense. And some of her stuff is just like, seems like affectation to me. And I love the way you said that everyone you interviewed about Nico imitates her voice. Of course. It's hilarious. Yeah. It is hilarious. And, <laughs> and a lot of them I still have on uh, recordings of, and they're very, very funny. Uh, yeah. Because everybody wants to do Nico. So what? See, all tomorrow's parties means something for back then. But to me, it means someone who's going to miss all tomorrow's parties, which go on to now. It could do. It could do. Yeah, I've got it's... people shouting at me because I've got to go into a budget meeting. A bu okay. All right. <laughs> That's my day job. No. <laughs> <laughs> um no this is this has been lovely i've really enjoyed it and um i appreciate it and uh, you've obviously read the book which is important because um my one of my favorite ever private eye cartoons is two guys at a book launch and and one says to the other have you read the book and the other person goes yeah i mean not personally <laughs> yeah i know it's like someone's interviewed on good morning america and they'll say what's your book about and i'm thinking it's that does a total i'm like you does a total disservice you don't come into an interview not having read the book it would make no sense plus it's incredibly rude yeah it happens all the time yeah i remember i was on breakfast television once years ago being interviewed about something or other and um I was being squeezed between the weather and a Billy Idol video. And I thought to myself, this, it kind of doesn't matter what I do here. And the guy said, so why did you write the book? And I said, because I was paid to. And then it kind of unraveled into a kind of, a, a, uh, it was quite postmodern. Actually, I'm not sure it did much for the sales of the book, but it's quite funny anyway. Yeah, well, to end it with, that's like what Lou Reed did. He, he reveled on the idea of making other people uncomfortable. And I think at times you probably do the same thing. Do I? You think I do? Well, you did this. You said the interview unraveled. It unraveled because you said one thing and then the guy's- Yeah, I suppose him. so. He's off yeah. base. Yeah. Now, on, on um, I think that, my, I think my parting shot will be many books that I do or many projects that I embark upon, I spend a lot of time with these people and then I, I spent a, then I spent a lot of time with their work. I remember I did a big project on, on, on Jim Morrison once, which, which was actually a, a, a bestseller in the United States of America. And yeah, um, my bookstore. Um, well, you're a very, you're a very good man. I take it all back. And um, when I finished that project, I liked Jim Morrison a lot less than I did when I started. And with, with Lou Reed, it's the opposite actually. I appreciate him more having spent all this time with him and his work and people with, he knew him and his music. I like his music a lot more than I did when it came out actually. Yeah, when I- So I, that says something about him. Maybe it me, me, means I listen more. But actually, I don't think that's true. I think it's, got, no, it's not about listening more. It's about listening in a particular way. Anyway, there we are. Yeah, I thought you had a go. I'm going to love you and leave you. Thank you so much for this. It, it's been brilliant. And I love speaking to someone who actually knows what they're talking about. Well, I'll see if I can find someone for you. <laughs> hey! <laughs> hey, I'll do the jokes. Come on. <laughs> All right, well, we'll end it with me being the funny one. <laughs> okay, well, write another book and then we can talk again. That I will. You take good care. You too. So long. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.